Moving on with concavity and points of inflection, we've just defined what both of these were, and we figured out what they look like on the graph. Now the question is, is if they give it to us in a function format, how do we do that instead? So let's go through the steps to finding concavity and points of inflection. These steps are almost identical to the steps that we did when we were trying to find increasing and decreasing. The only thing that changes is that we're going to use the second derivative rather than the first derivative. So we find the domain, meaning what values are excluded because that's going to affect the number line that we'll have to do eventually. We find the second derivative. We set that second derivative equal to zero. So when we did this with increasing and decreasing, we called those our critical values, which became our extrema, our max mins, or neither. Here, these are the possible inflection points. Not guaranteed inflection points, but possible points where it switches between concavity. So if we know those points where it switches between, then we need to figure out where it's concave up and concave down. And we do that by using the number line, the same thing that we did with the increasing, decreasing max and min. So once we set up our number lines, which uses the inflection points, and it uses the domain restrictions that we had, we test the intervals in between those points. We test them in the second derivative because that's going to be our focus here. So if the second derivative comes out to be positive, that means it's concave up like a cup. If it's negative, that means it's concave down like a frown. Okay. After we do that, we select the appropriate intervals if we're looking for concavity or if it's asking for inflection points. If it switches between concavity, then it is a guaranteed inflection point. And once we get all of our answers figured out, then of course I always recommend to double check with your calculator. Now, one more time, since I'm the teacher, these are the steps that I'm going to give to you in this order. But if I was a student, I would probably move step number seven up to step number one, because I would want to check each and everything as I'm doing it and not as my very last step, because if I made any errors along the way, I, that means I would have done the whole problem and didn't figure out that I made a mistake until the very end. So if you do the calculator first, then you can check little things along the way, and if you make any mistakes, you can fix it then before moving on. Okay, now that we have these steps, let's use them in an example. So they give us the function f of x equals x squared, all over 3x plus 6. And we want to figure out where this function is concave up, like a cup, concave down, like a frown, and the coordinates of all inflection points. So let's go through our steps here. Step number one is to find the domain. Domain is really important if we ever have fractions or square roots. In this problem, we have a fraction, so we need to worry about where my denominator is equal to zero. If we solve this one, that gives us that x is equal to negative two. So that is a vertical asymptote. So we know that since we have a vertical asymptote at negative two, our graph cannot take on that value. Step number two is to find the second derivative. So this is where most of the work might actually come from. Okay, let's do the first derivative, and I'm going to do it by um, the quotient rule. But if you want to convert it and do the derivative by using some other rules, then that's perfectly fine too. So low d high, the original of the low, times the derivative of my high, which is 2x, minus high d low. So the original of the high times the derivative of the low all over my low squared. Simplifying the top by distributing my 2x and multiplying these out over here, that gives me a 6x squared plus a 12x minus 3x squared. The denominator, we want to keep it in factored form. And so 6x squared Minus 3x squared gives me a 3x squared plus 12x all over 
my denominator squared. Okay, if we were just taking the first derivative, then I would leave it like this, but now I need to take the second derivative. So since I want to take the second derivative of this, I want to simplify the first derivative of it as far as possible. Now, in the numerator, notice that we have something in common, but we also have that thing in common in the denominator, too. We have a factor of 3 in common between all of these things here. I cannot just factor it out of the denominator because I have it squared. So let me show you a different way that I can manipulate this denominator. So 3x plus 6 squared is like a 3x plus 6 times a 3x plus 6. Well, I can take a 3 out of the first piece, and that leaves me with the x plus 2. And I can take a 3 out of the second piece, and that also leaves me with an x plus 2. So I have 3 times 3, which gives me 9, and then x plus 2 squared. So this is a different format of what the denominator is. It's still in factored format, but it's actually more factored because I have my common factor factored up. So I'm going to write the denominator in that way. And then that way, when I take a 3 out of the numerator, I can cancel these. Now, I can also take an x out of the numerator, but I don't want to do that because it's actually going to be easier in my second derivative if I leave it in non-factored format. And I'll kind of explain that when I go to my second derivative step. But I do want to factor out the 3 because I can reduce with it and I can cancel. So if I take the 3 out, that leaves me with an x squared plus 4x. So that means I can cancel out my constant terms. So that leaves me with a 3 in the denominator. Okay. So let me write down my final version of my first derivative here. So f prime of x is equal to x squared plus 4x over 3 times x plus 2 quantity squared. So I think this is the best format to take my second derivative of. So let's go ahead and get into that then. Now, when I take the second derivative of it, I have a fraction, so that means I have a quotient rule. But I have an inside-outside piece, so that means I also have a chain rule. If I were to put my numerator in the factored format when I factored out my x, that means I would have also had a product rule along with my quotient and my chain rule. If I leave it in this format, that means I don't have a product rule. That means I just have my quotient and my chain rule, and I think that's enough. So that's why I suggested to leave it in this fashion. Okay. So first is my quotient rule, low d high, so my original of my low times the derivative of my high, which is 2x plus 4, minus high d low. So my original of my high times the derivative of my low. Well, my constant of 3 stays out, then my chain rule, so I pull my 2 down, I keep my inside the same, I subtract a power, and then I take it times the derivative of my inside, which is just 1. And that is all over my denominator squared. Okay, so it's pretty messy at this point. Let's see if we can kind of clean it up a little bit, make it a little prettier. So... I'm going to think of this as two pieces here. In my first piece, I want to see what I can do to clean it up. And then my second piece, I want to see what I can do to clean it up. So these pieces are separated by my subtraction sign. In my first piece, I notice that this parentheses here has a common factor of 2. So I'm going to factor out that 2, and I'm going to put it up here with the 3. So this is like me saying I have a 3 times with the 2 that I'm going to factor out. So why not simplify that to give me a 6? I have this x plus 2 squared. And then when I factor out a 2 from this piece, that actually leaves me with x plus 2. So if I want to write this in the most condensed format, 
that leaves me with 6 times x plus 2 to the third power, because I have three of them all the same. Now my subtraction here in the middle. And now I want to figure out what I have to do with this back piece. Okay, so let me multiply my constants out here, 3 times 2, and of course if 1 was a different number, I would have to worry about that as well. Um, in this guy here, I have a common factor of x, so let me go ahead and take that x out now. That leaves me with the x plus 4, and then just copying down this piece here, which is an x plus 2. All over. Now let me condense this denominator a little bit. I can distribute my square to each of my factors. 3 squared gives me 9. And then x plus 2 squared squared. If I multiply these exponents, that gives me x plus 2 to the 4th. Now I know in my next step of finding concavity, I need to set this equal to 0. That means I want this fraction in the most factored form as possible. So I'm going to factor this by doing a common factor, again between my two pieces. I want to see what I have in common between this piece and what I have in common between that piece. So I see between those I have a 6 and I have an x plus 2 in common. So if I take that out, I need to figure out what I have left over between my two blue pieces there. So my first one. If I take this here and factor out this here, my 6 factors out and one of these x plus 2 factors out, but I'm left with two of the x plus 2s. And I'm going to go ahead and write them out because I'm going to need to FOIL them for my next step. Then minus now this piece factoring out this here. So my 6 factors out, I'm left over with my x. My x plus 2 factors out, but I'm left over with an x plus 4. And that is all divided by my 9 times x plus 2 to the 4th. So now what I need to do is I need to simplify what's in this bracket, and that's going to make this whole numerator in the most factored form as possible. So by doing that, I need to FOIL this out here and distribute my x out there. So along with simplifying my brackets here, let's see if I can simplify something else. Notice with these two pieces here. Let's take them one thing at a time. First I have a 6 and a 9. So I can divide both of those by 3. 6 divided by 3 gives me 2. 9 divided by 3 gives me 3. And then also with these x plus 2s, I have one of them there, and I have four of them there. So I can cancel out one. So this one in the top will eliminate, and then I cancel out one in the bottom, leaves me with three of them left there. So that leaves me with a 2 in the numerator, along with my simplified brackets, which I'll move to next, and my denominator, a 3 times x plus 2 to the third. Now I need to FOIL out those two sets of parentheses. So x plus 2 times x plus 2 gives me x squared plus 4x plus 4. Now in the back, I need to distribute this x here. But I'm going to make it a little simpler, and I'm going to distribute the negative with the x all the way through. So negative x times x gives me a negative x squared. And negative x times 4 gives me a negative 4x. Okay, one more step to simplifying the brackets, and then I think I am finished with my second derivative. So I have 2. My x squared minus x squared cancels out. My 4x minus 4x cancels out. So all I'm left with in that brackets then is a 4. So I can simplify this. 2 times my 4, which gives me my 8 in the numerator, and then my denominator is what it is. 3 over x plus 2 to the third.
so let me scroll back up through all of this work that we've done here. So that was the work of finding my second derivative, the work of finding my first derivative, and I have pasted my answer up here. My second derivative is this here. Because of time, I'm going to end this video here, but in the next video, I'll come back to finishing up finding my concavity and inflection points of this problem.